Hello everyone, welcome to the Hexes 2018, the second annual Hexy Awards. It's been 12 months now, it's been a long 12 months where I've played a lot of games. Not quite as many as last year, but I've still played a lot of games. And this list I present to you is my prerogative, my right as a YouTuber, to make a list to celebrate the end of the year. And this year, I've picked around about 10 games that I think are fantastic. Any one of them could have been crowned Game of the Year, but only one was. And rather than going through them all and then crowning a winner like last year, I'm just saving the best for last. Now, the, uh, the games on the list are an odd cross mix. They're stuff that I enjoyed playing. And there was no real criteria in this other than it's something that rattled around my head when I was done playing. I think the sign of a really great game is that you can't shake it when you know your, your head stays with it and it just it just keeps popping up and that's how I tell a really great game from a really good game. And this year there was a lot. I mean I had to knock stuff off the list because there was so much stuff that I really really enjoyed that it was really hard to get down to this arbitrary number I'd picked. And without further ado, let me present to you the best games of 2018. Crosscode came out of Early Access on the 21st of September 2018. It's developed by Radical Fish Games and published by Deck 13. It describes itself as an action RPG, which is, which is fair. It's a top-down game, well, sort of top-down game, slightly at an angle, but anyway. It's a top-down game of pixel art and action. You go through the game attacking things and leveling up because the game takes place inside this fake MMO. So it's not an MMO, it's most certainly a single-player game. But the game setting is that of an MMO. Uh, and you're playing a character who's lost her memory. And you're playing the MMO for some reason to regain your memories. That's not really clear. That's plot points. I haven't actually got to the end yet. So I can't actually tell you and wouldn't if I could. <laughs> the game is beautifully constructed. You level up. You go through areas. You take quests. You uncover plot. You meet people. You add to your friends list on the way within the fake MMO you're playing. And then you have dungeons to go through. Each dungeon takes all the stuff you learnt up until this point, that skills you've picked up, unlocked, um, devices you've had, and levers you've pulled. And you go through the dungeon, which is mostly a puzzle dungeon, like very much Zelda-inspired puzzle dungeon. And then you have a ridiculously hard boss fight, and then you go through the next portion of the game, each time as you go, getting drip-fed this overarching plot, which I really liked. The setting of a fake MMO is something I'm surprised we don't see more of in games because there are a lot of things in MMOs that are good, but the actual MMO side of it becomes a massive time sink and a problem. So yeah, the uh, to use an MMO as a catalyst to tell a story, like a very self-aware game, is good and it's something I found really interesting. And the pixel art in this game is just wonderful. I really, really like the pixel art in this game. And the storytelling being drip-fed could get annoying, but I find they drip-feed you enough story, enough pace, that you're constantly like, ooh, okay, you're constantly interested. Because you've got the plot of the uh, the character who's playing the MMO, as well as the actual game itself you're playing, which is an interesting idea. That uh, Yeah, an interesting idea that's really quite well pulled off. Lots of people only shop on Steam, and that's fine. We should all choose our own delivery platform. But uh, if anything's going to tempt you off Steam, it should be Dicey Dungeons. Dicey Dungeons is available over on itch.io for $7.50, where you can play the development version. It's coming out in full release in a few months and will almost definitely make its way to Steam at some point. But you can play it now on itch. In fact, you can play it now for free on itch if you don't mind playing a drastically earlier version of it. And you should. Because Dicey Dungeons is hard to explain. It's by Terry Kavanagh, the guy that gave you VVVVVVV and Super Hexagon. And this time, Dicey Dungeons is a game <laughs> about dice and dungeons. It's the only way I can describe it. Uh, there, are, there are five characters to choose from. Each character plays drastically differently. And your job is to get through the dungeon. And you do that with dice rolls. And it's not so much RNG because you're attaching different skills, different weapons to different dice numbers. And really, it's uh, it's just a mechanism for generating interactivity. Like, there's the same chance of putting a 6 as there is a 1 with a dice roll. So if you're the witch and you put a skill on 5, it's really not looking for a high or low number. You're looking specifically for a 5. It could be random letters rather than numbers. So don't think this is a maths game. It's really not. 
And your job is to go to the dungeon, you have combat, you uh, you whittle down the health to zero, and then you move to the next square in the dungeon, which platform probably more than square, but uh, which may have a, a shop on it, may have a chest on it, or will probably more than likely have a battle on it. There's even leveling up where you level up and then you get more powerful and you have more slots, more abilities, more dice. Um, depending which character you're playing and really it's just about getting through it the only thing i can describe that's really like dicey dungeons is slay the spire which is a card game but they're very very similar in a lot of ways in this way that you sort of you're using the rng in your favor and you begin to work that rng um yeah i'm explaining it very badly go and play go and play the preview build that's available on each for free it's it's self-explanatory as soon as you start playing you will get it and be like Oh yeah, okay, I see what they're doing here. But it, it, it it's hard to verbalise. <laughs> but uh, Terry Kavanagh has yet to make anything bad. Um, so there's there's some pedigree already to attest for it. But uh, $7.50 is not a lot of money to pay for this game at all. And again, the preview version is free if you're not sure. But remember, the preview version's got spectrum looking graphics which i actually found super charming uh, and the new one has got some very nice hand-drawn artwork style stuff going on hero you road to redemption developed and published by transsolar games and released on the 10th of july 2018 this game is priced at 27 pounds 79 pence on steam and it's by Corey and laurie cole the creators of quest for glory series so it seems odd to me that this game came out very quietly it wasn't even on my radar till a friend gave me a key for it I was like look go go play this is good and that's exactly what i did the game is set entirely within this school, and the school really does feel like a character in the game. It's very consistently designed, and it just feels like a real place. It's like the developers went to this place and then drew a map and then they set their game there. It just feels so incredibly consistent, which is nice. All the characters you encounter in this role-play adventure are written uniquely. They all feel like real people that have a place being there. None of them feel like add-on or just to fill the crowd. They all feel like they're fleshed out individuals, which is really nice. The endless time management of the game, at times you feel like it's annoying because you have to go to class, you have to do practices, you, you have to check a skill to make sure it doesn't start going down again. You know, there are things you kind of have to do but as you play through it becomes a routine and it means that you're not wandering around aimlessly in this game because of this time management you always feel like you have purpose the game's also quite witty and funny is probably an overstatement but it certainly made me smile a few times and it's written in a charming way that really does kind of make you smile consistently i wouldn't go as far as saying it's a comedy game though because the thing is with comedy games is they're annoying and this finding fine line between funny and amusing is is where this game lives it's that sweet spot where it makes you smile the characters are interested and they say funny things because they're real people here are you it's kind of worth playing cultist simulator published by humble bundle and developed by weather factory is a game that i didn't know if i was going to put on this list or not in fact right at the moment when i was about to record this audio chunk I nearly removed it from the list. The reason for that is because even though I've played quite a lot of Cultist Simulator, I've talked at length with people excitedly about Cultist Simulator, and I've read more about Cultist Simulator than I maybe have any other game this year. It feels weird to be on the list because I don't know if I like Cultist Simulator or not. It is a card game of sorts that is a representation of someone's life or at least, their, at least their interest in the occult, I should say. Uh, there are cards that go with other cards. There are timed events. There's the ability to pause, which is quite handy. There are resources, and there is definitely 100% a greater point to this game, or at least it is implied there's a greater point. Uh, however, I am not sure if it is hipster nonsense or if it is genuinely an excellent and unique way of telling a story. I have no idea. I, I, I just don't know. But the fact that I don't know, the fact that I have no idea if it's hipster nonsense or a genuinely wonderful way to tell a story means that it is fascinating. Whichever one turns out to be true, it is absolutely fascinating to me. And it is something that I just constantly interested in. I just find it really, really interesting. 
even though don't know what's happening you know even though it's obtuse and weird and there's no real tutorial of sports there's like pop-up information but the idea is it's a voyage of discovery and you're constantly looking and learning and doing something and yeah i i could just i can literally talk for hours about all the weird things called the simulator does and i've got some weird stories and when i tell the stories when i recount the stories about the things i've done in the game i realize that it doesn't sound anything like a card game when i'm recounting the story um which is a testament to how it tells stories itself the fact that you can recount all these things you did and not once mention cards you can mention resources the things you had at hand but yeah it, it's interesting i also admire the way it was priced because this game is 14 pounds 99 and when it came out it was pretty much i think it was about a pound more when it came out maybe i don't know around about that price when it came out but if you bought it the day it came out or the week it came out i should say you got the uh the version of the game that had all the dlc as in the dlc to be released in the future it was a way of buying a game and then guarantee you'll have all the dlc to come but it's not a season pass you're just paying it the same price as you would as you would after a month six months after it's released i'm assuming it doesn't go on sale but if you buy it in the first week you're getting that perpetual version that's constantly updated um i made me buy it earlier than i probably would have done i mean i'm fairly sure i would have great anyway but i was like hey if i buy it now i don't have to ever worry about dlc uh, which is a really interesting way of pricing a game, an interesting way of convincing people to sink into your game in the first week, while at the same time not making them buy bloody season passes and extended versions and all this nonsense. At the moment, though, there is only one £2.50 expansion in the game called the Cultist Simulator The Dancer, uh, which adds quite a few new cards and new things to the game. So at the moment, it's not been a great investment, but I'm sure there's a lot more. There's a lot more to come from them. There's a lot more on their roadmap. And it seems like the game we're going to end up with after all this DLC is released is going to be a lot more refined than the game that we had in the first week. So Cult of Simulation is something I keep revisiting. But yeah, still don't know if I actually like it or not. I just don't know. And that's so interesting to me. Ion Maiden developed by void point llc and published by 3d realms is a throwback it's also in early access which means it's entirely possible this game is going to make it to next year's video as well at the moment you can play a standalone campaign which is around about an hour and a half long i want to say yeah about an hour and a half long um quite repeatable because there's loads of secrets and then when the game's released there'll be a full single player campaign to go on top of that preview campaign the game is priced at 15 pounds 49 and uh, I believe there will be a price rise when it leaves early access. This is a game that runs the Duke Nukem engine. This is the game run the, running the same engine that Duke Nukem run. It's been modernised. It's got modern lighting. It's got some, some more advanced physics in there. But uh, the joy of it being the Duke Nukem engine means that it looks like a legit 90s game. It's proper 90s. It's not just like an homage to 90s games. It essentially is a 90s game. But because it's not the 90s anymore, we've got such massive levels this engine you just do ridiculously huge levels which is wonderful and it's fast it's so incredibly fast because 90 shooters were fast and they seem to have slowed down over the last few years so it's hugely refreshing to play something that's so fast and unapologetic this game is brutal it knows it's brutal and it just it just leads into it it's not ashamed of what it is and i really loved it considering the single player campaign that's currently in there's like an hour and a half to two hours long i've played this game for nearly seven hours which tells you how much i enjoyed i just kept going through it it was great i had nothing bad to say about it it was an instant replay for me um the visual variety of the enemies is over the top 90s horror sci-fi nonsense the lead character is female she she is the ion maiden um and yeah she's fully armored this isn't a game like duke nukem we're not going to get any weird misogyny inserted in here um i feel like the lead character being female is like their way of apologizing for duke nukem <laughs> apologizing for the duke nukem misogyny um it's nice to play a game that is in the duke nukem engine that you don't have to feel i don't know oddly embarrassed to play because kicking ass and chewing gum and pixelated strippers are very much a thing of the past now and i think gaming's moved past that and iron maiden is a celebration of that while at the same time 
being that 90s shooter which i really adored it was just a total refreshing change and really it kind of revitalized my interest in first person shooters because i was getting a little bit bored of first person shooters and then this came along and sort of refreshed it for me i am chomping at the bit desperate to play the full campaign and when it drops i will most certainly be playing through the whole thing gleefully lazy galaxy is a clicker and it's no secret, I like me some clickers. I even wrote an article this year on Ludic Linux about how much I like clickers. But uh, this one hit me for 108 hours before I even noticed. It's priced at £4.79, which is a very small amount of money to pay for 100 hours of gameplay, I think. Uh, and it's developed and published by Cold Wild Games. Now, this one sucked me in because it has absolutely no microtransactions whatsoever, which means I'm free to click and click and click and click, and it'll never make me watch an ad or ask me for money for stupid gems. I can just go nuts with this one, which is what I did. There are two phases to the game. The first phase, which is the largest time sink, you build a base on a, on a planet, and you start harvesting resources. Then when you've got enough resources, you start building ships. Once you build ships, the second phase kicks in, which is a short space battle. Uh, you can hire a general or to do it for you or take direct control and you can destroy everything in space and then move on to the next planet. That is essentially the game loop of Lazy Galaxy. But it's hugely satisfying. The numbers get bigger at a reasonable speed. And yeah, I, I, 100 hours speaks for itself, I think. It's, it's such a fun game. And if you like clickers, this is one of the best. Maybe one day I'll do my top 10 clickers. But this one will definitely be in the top 5 without, without any thoughts whatsoever. It was followed up by Cold Wild Games with a side-scrolling shooter, of all things, um, which was which was quite good, very good indeed, actually. But it's the clicker that just sucked me in for 100 hours. Um, it is nice that this, the follow-up was set in the same universe, so it seems like Cold Wild Games are hoping to make a series of games all set in this one sort of this one universe thing that they're going to be spanning out, which is good. Um, I hope to see another clicker from them at some point because it's so exciting to play. Um, yeah, exciting for clicker sounds weird, but that space battle is kind of like yeah, you know, you're watching it pan out and things are happening. And at one point, in one battle, I was like, I'm going to win this. I'm on the edge of my seat, and that's something that clickers don't usually give you, which is why it's in this video. 10 Ton Limited is a developer that self publishes, and their experiences are iterative. Every game builds on the previous game. It's not usually a sequel or anything, but they take the lessons they learned in the last game, the things they've learned how to do, the things that they should have done differently, and they learn from their mistakes, they learn from their past. Uh, and that's great. I mean, that's what you want from a developer. You want every game to be slightly better than the last one. 10 Tons Limited tend to make top-down shooters, sort of bullet hell, but usually with a spin. Um, some of them have a long narrative experience, some of them have mission-based things, and in the case of Tesla vs. Lovecraft, you have to kill all the monsters. It's a very, very silly plot in Tesla vs. Lovecraft, where, you know, Tesla and Lovecraft are at war throughout London. That, that's essentially the plot. That's essentially the plot. Um, but what you get here is an excuse to have a wonderful top-down twin stick style shooter which is actually best played with the keyboard and mouse the term twin sticks a bit nonsensical when i think about it and you have some tight controls you have weird power-ups and because it's tesla versus lovecraft you have absolutely insane monsters that come after you uh, if i had to have a criticism i'd say the monster variety should be a bit more mixed up early on but that's neither here nor there because as you go through the game and the bosses and the heavier monsters turn up it does start having a lot of visual variety very quickly uh, it's just those first couple of levels are a lot of weird fishmen. The game has interesting power-ups and an interesting roguelike mechanic where every play, every time you start a level, you start off as base you. You're just normal, normal Mr. Tesla with no skills. And then you level up inside each, each level, um, adding things like extra barrels to your guns, um, a wave of death around you which slowly ticks down enemy health, or... Um, Things like bullets that ricochet, bullets that go through enemies. You just you level at a very good pace. You can usually get through a few levels at the very start of the game when you first res up. And the reason for that is you res up in a mech that gets you shoot things. Yep, a full-on sci-fi robot steampunky mech. And then when the mech's destroyed after about, I think I want to say about 20 seconds, maybe more. I can't remember actually. Um, you then start finding parts of the mech around the level. And then as soon as you assembled the whole mech, you can hit E and redeploy that mech and have another 20-odd seconds of absolute awesome, which means that not only are you trying to kill all the things, you're also trying to do as awesome as possible because mechs, it's a game that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I'm really impressed at the progress 10-turn make. Every game is just so much better. 
and it's just so wonderful to see a developer learn from stuff and manage to be self-published the whole time when they're doing it. Tesla vs. Lovecraft, absolutely worth checking out. It was released on the 26th of January 2018, and it's priced at £10.99. Minute was published by Devolver Digital and developed by J.W. Kitty, Jukio and Dom. That's one developer called J.W. Kitty, Jukio and Dom. I assume that's four people. It's priced at £6.99 and it's about three hours long. The game is black and white and it's black and white for a reason. The reason is it needs some absolutely supreme visual clarity. There needs to be no ambiguity in what things are or where you can and can't go. The reason for that is that the plot of the game is your little duck person who has a cursed sword. The sword lets you live for 60 seconds and then kills you. You then respawn at the last bed you slept at, which allows you to traverse this whole world in 60 second increments. You can also kill yourself early if you want with the tap of a button. There are things in the game that make you annoyed, but in a good way. There's a character that talks slowly, so you have to sprint there just to get through what he's saying, which is nuts and annoying, but at the same time, kind of genius. The shtick of dying every minute should get boring very quickly, but the fact that you're constantly trying to find a better route somewhere, a better way to get somewhere, or, or doing multiple tasks in, in one life, makes the game super interesting. It is something that I gleefully went through. And it's also a game that made me say the words on stream, what do you mean I've got no time? I've got four seconds, that's loads of time. Yep, towards the end of this game, I'd stopped thinking about time like a human. I literally started processing time in increments of things I could do. Every second became a slice of multiple things I could do. The controls are so tight, I managed to really start getting so many things done so fast. And you zip round. But after a while, you don't feel rushed. You start feeling like you're in this weird zen-like state. And it's just wonderful to go through. And it really has left a lasting impression on me. I played it just after launch on the 3rd of April. And it was just great. It just really did capture my imagination. And make me feel like I'd not played anything like this before. Now I know games have had time this before. And I know games have had lo-fi graphics. And nothing it does individually is particularly revolutionary. But the way it puts it all together and the way it tells you stories without wasting your time and the way it uses this time mechanic and it's just it's just so well done. I'm just genuinely really, really happy with the whole concise thing. I hope they never do a sequel to it. I hope it's something that we just see this one thing and then that's it because I feel like anything they do to sequelize it can't ever honor what this game is. It's been a while since I played something that was this sort of profound and affected me like this. The last one I can really think of was Undertale that really sort of hit me. But uh, Minute's definitely as good, as charming, and as memorable as any of those super cult, super classic games. I feel a bit sad that it's not more well known than it is, and you should definitely check it out for the modest price of six ninety nine. It's time to ask, what was the best game I played of 2018? The game I have enjoyed the most ever. The one I think may be the best game ever made, in my very subjective personal opinion that is, is the game I'm about to talk about. And it's not just the game of 2018, it's the game of my life so far, pretty much. So I'm happy to talk about this game. A long time ago, I had this game on a pocket PC type device. It was like a Windows C device, mine was like a handheld tablet. And it was called Space Traders. I think it was a re-implementation of an earlier game um, that was also a re-implementation of an even earlier game. But the basic loop was, you had a little spaceship and a dude, and you'd go from planet to planet buying and selling goods. On the way, you'd have combat, or you'd run from combat. And occasionally, there'd be a quest that drops to your lap of you've got so many days to get to a certain place. It was a very simple game that was wonderful. But it was a game that really captured me, and I played, I played so much of it. So when Star Traders Frontiers was described to me in a way that made it sound very similar, I emailed the developers, the Tracy brothers, and I was like, hey guys, can, can I get a key for this game? They replied pretty quickly. The next day I jumped into Star Traders. Star Traders Frontiers is an absolutely wonderful game. Star Traders Frontiers is the single best game I have ever played. That seems like a, that seems like a lot to say. Well, the fact is, there's a lot going on in this game. 
you start off and you're 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 a space captain and you have a mission to do and that's the part of the plot. But while you're following this this grand galaxy sweeping plot, you can also buy and sell stuff to make some extra money on the side. You can get involved in the political affairs of of different planets. You can get involved in their wars. You can do all this grand thing in a game made by two people. It's ridiculous how much stuff there is in here. And the systems at first seem massively oppressive. It seems like there's so much to do. Like the, the menu you get when you land your ship alone can take you like half an hour to figure out the first time you play. But once you do, you realize this allows you so much freedom. You can level up everyone in your crew. You can level up, you can specialize your captain. You can make them all do lots of different things. You can have ground combat. You can spy. You can you can take part in the military operations. And this is done with a series of systems. The, um, there's a lot of menus in the space station which allow you to choose accurately exactly what you want to do, where it comes to upgrades, or it comes to buying new ships, or it comes to hiring staff. But then you can also go and do the politics, which is all done via a card game, which is like you get draw some cards, cards get disappeared the last one remaining is the result but that's not rng because you can affect this with the way you train your people the way you train your troops affects the outcome of these card games <laughs> the uh the blockade system is done the same but on the blockade system there's a chance for you to then get involved in combat which is then turn-based it is so wonderful to see all the things this game does gel together so beautifully on top of that, you've got this ground combat, which I can only describe as a re-implementation of Darkest Dungeon, because that's kind of what it is. It's like they've looked at Darkest Dungeon and go, that's a whole game. It shouldn't be. That should be a component in a greater game. And that's exactly what they've done here. And they've turned the ground combat itself into something exciting because it doesn't happen all the time. But the card game's exciting because it doesn't happen all the time. There's so much going on that you don't see too much of anything. All of this happening in a wonderfully realized world where the plot itself is something you'd read in the absolute best political science fiction novel. It is just beautiful. And I absolutely say, 100%, that Star Trailers is not just my game of the year. It's quite literally the game of any year. I can't imagine anything coming out that's going to that's gonna be better than Star Trailers when it comes to my gaming tastes. Now, your gaming tastes may be different to mine. So, I would say, have a look at the store page. Have a little think about the type of games you want. If you want a first-person shooter, Star Traders is probably not for you. But if you want something that's going to take you absolutely hours of intrigue to work through, then Star Traders is for you. Regardless of what the Tracy Brothers release next, it will be an instant purchase for me. Well... There we have it guys, the reveals are done. The games I thought were the best of 2018 have now been listed as a good YouTuber should. It's telling to me that all the games on this list have been indie games. Not one AAA game even crossed my mind. They didn't even make it to the list temporarily at any point, which is quite telling to me. I'm truly grateful for all the people that care what I think about games, because it's weird for me that people do. And uh, it's something that I found really rewarding to do. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute honor to make videos for you, and I'll see you all in the new year.